Hi, everyone. Uh, we will take a couple minutes to let people into the Zoom room. We'll start in a minute or so. Well, let's, I think let's get started now. Um, hi, my name is uh, Albert Park. I'm in the history department and I uh, focus on East Asian, Korean and Japanese history. I'm also one of the co-PIs of EnviroLab Asia, which is a five college initiative to study environmental issues in Asia. Um, and it's a, a, a program that uh, involves all the five colleges and is uh, centered at uh, Claremont McKenna College. Um, this year, uh, we have been sponsoring a series of talks. Um, last semester, we sponsored talks on environmental racism. And this semester, we've been sponsoring talks on environmental justice. And all of these talks have been uh, sponsored by the Claremont McKenna Office of the President's uh, Anti-Racism uh, Initiative and the Black Experience. And so we're very uh, grateful to that initiative for funding our speakers uh, this, this past year. Uh, today is our last uh, talk uh, for the semester. And uh, we have, uh, it's, 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 it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Bill Asher here. And let me just, uh, kind of give you some background of Professor Asher. Uh, Professor Asher is the Donald C. McKenna Professor of Government and Economics at Claremont McKenna College. He currently directs Claremont McKenna's Roberts Environmental Center and the International Relations Program. Previously, he was director of Duke University's Public Policy Institute and the Duke Center for International De Development. With a PhD in political science from Yale University, his research is on development policy, focusing on all de developing regions, spanning economic, natural resource, and environmental policy. He's held consulting positions with the World Bank, the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Ford Foundation, the Hudson Institute, the U.S. Department, a State Department, the U.S. Justice Department, and the U U United States Environmental Protection Agency. He has a long list of, a very distinguished list of, of, of publications. And among his 13 single or corporate books, the most recent are uh, Development Strategies and in Group Violence, The Evolution of Development Thinking, Governance, Economics, Existence, and Security, and The Psychology of Poverty Alleviation, Challenges in Developing Countries. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Professor Asher here. And so, uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to admit that I'm a repurposed Latin Americanist, but I became increasingly fascinated by Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, even so, I cannot claim to be an expert on even one of the countries in Southeast Asia to the same degree that someone from that country would claim. So anyone who tries to do work across different regions or across different countries has to do it with a certain degree of humility. And I wanna express that right up front. So the topic, defending natural resource rights of ethnic minorities is one piece of a larger project that I'm engaging in during this coming summer with a number of CMC students. The basic focus of it is how you can humanely bring some of the economically backward regions within countries in Southeast Asia to converge more with the more advanced areas. And to do this without damaging the human rights, the cultures, and the well being of these ethnic minorities. So, if the question is, how are these things related? You'll find it's a very difficult question. Human rights of ethnic minorities depends on cultural preservation, 
but also the avoidance of oppression. And in this discussion, you'll see there's been a lot of oppression that has gone on. There's also poverty per se. In many, many instances, ethnic minorities are among the poorest people in the countries of Southeast Asia, in part because more dominant groups have forced them into less hospitable parts of the country. It's no accident that many ethnic minorities live in hilly or even mountainous areas. That's because the better areas have already been taken up by more dominant groups. It also turns out that much of what's been going on in the areas where ethnic minorities live has resulted in natural resource degradation, in part because the user rights of these minorities have been usurped by other groups. And no surprise, this leads to intergroup conflict. So what our project is gonna focus on is to try to understand all of these connections. So when we talk about ethnic groups in Southeast Asian countries, we have to recognize that this is a much trickier notion than you might think. If you look at Myanmar, for example, mainstream Burmese make up nearly 70% of the population, but then there are many other ethnic groups in the country. If you look at Vietnam, you'll see it's a smaller proportion, so it is claimed, but also a very wide range of different ethnicities. In Laos, only a little bit more than half of people would regard themselves as Lao. Many other ethnic groups exist there. In Cambodia, as you could see, many Khmer, but also Vietnamese, Chinese, and others. And very often, this category of others belies the fact that there are very distinctive ethnicities. Indonesia, of course, with its islands, the Javanese make up about 40%, but Sundanese, people who are also on the island of Java, add another 15%. So more than half of Indonesians are actually Javanese in terms of the island itself. Note how large this category of other is for Indonesia. And many of those people are of ethnic minorities. In Malaysia, as probably most of you know, there's long been the standoff between Malays, Chinese, and Indians. But there's also this 11% that the Malaysian Department of Statistics calls Aborigines. And this really is the ethnic minority in the country. Thailand is fascinating in terms of how Thais think about ethnicity. They distinguish between Northern Thais, Northeastern Thais, Isanese, Central Thais, and Southern Thais. But these are all people who speak Thai, T-A-I. And then there are many other groups there, including so-called other ethnic minorities with a very small percent. Now, just to demonstrate how ambiguous these categories are, look at what the Encyclopedia Britannica has said about Thailand. 97.5% Thai, tiny amount of Burmese, and then others. What's the reality? 15% of people in Thailand do not speak Thai, that is the broader linguistic group, as their mother tongue. Huge variety in terms of what people in Thailand speak as their first language. In the South, many of them speak Malaysian or Malay variants for that Muslim population. Now, when we think about these ethnic minorities, often we say, Gee, they're so quaint. Look at this guy wearing a, a Dayak outfit. Look at these women who are engaging in this dance. Uh, this is what the tourists see 
when they go to places like Pontianak in uh, West Kalimantan. Or when I was there, you see these old relics of the weapons of uh, the Dayaks. But the reality is that despite how exotic these people might seem, and if you look at the picture in the lower left, you can see why it is that people are so fascinated by how people live their lives. The reality is that people are just like everybody else. They are, here's the normal dress of people in, this happens to be in, in Malaysia, in Malaysia's part of Borneo. And you can see that they're labeling themselves Dayak. Dayak is a term that was not what these, what these ethnic minorities would call themselves in Malaysian or Indonesian Borneo, but they've taken this on for the sake of solidarity. And this is a very sad banner, obviously. NRC really stands for the natural rights that these people had been promised at various times and which have been abrogated in many circumstances. So let's try to get down more to what's going on. In Indonesia, ethnic minorities, that is minorities that are neither Muslim nor Christian or other so-called recognized religions, have long been considered to be, in a sense, uncivilized. And here's a really dramatic quote by the governor of West Kalimantan, that's the westernmost province within Indonesia's Borneo, that West Kalimantan needed migrants to civilize the Dayaks, that these people who are living in these long houses were living in poor conditions, according to the Javanese. Uh, that these long houses, in fact, bred disease and bred bad attitudes like communism. And that the fact that Indonesia has had over the years this enormous transmigration program has had as one of its motivations, according to the government, to civilize the Dayaks. But of course, there are other reasons. And this chart shows how the demand for agriculture, the demand for the land for agriculture has been so important. Uh, the top line here is Indonesia. In the other countries, there's also been typically an increase in the amount of agricultural land. Well, where's the agricultural land gonna come from? It's not gonna come from hydroponics in the cities. It's gonna come from the forested areas. And where are the forested areas? They are in the less populated areas where these ethnic minorities live. So many people would think that most of the migration in Southeast Asia is urbanization. Most people would not be able to appreciate how much migration there really is. So if you look at the table on the left, you'll see that over even just a five year period, fairly large percentages of the populations in Southeast Asian countries are migrating. Uh, Cambodia, that's nearly a fifth of the population every five years would be expected to be in a different area. If you look at the chart on the right, you'll see that it is not just urbanization by any means. Rural to rural migration in Cambodia, and by the way, the statistics unfortunately are not as up to date as one would like, but getting these data is really difficult. For Cambodia, more than half of the migration was rural to rural. In the Philippines, nearly a third rural to rural. 
in Vietnam a third, and in fact, rural to urban migration was only a fifth or a third of what was going on in Southeast Asia. So what this means is that the fond hope that people who want to move are just gonna to move to the cities and leave ethnic minorities alone is not the way it happens. Many of the people who move rural to rural are moving into the areas where ethnic minorities live. In some cases, actually through government sponsored migration. Let's take a look at that. There are many state managed resettlement programs around the world, particularly in developing countries. And here we're talking about internal migration. In Indonesia, the famous or some would say notorious transmigrasi or transmigration program has moved so many million people over the years. And this is just 1905 to 1950, when the total population was 38 million people on average. The number of people moved was over 650,000. 1950 to 1977, more than 2 million people were moved. And they were moved from the so-called inner islands, that is the more congested islands of Java, Bali, and Madura, to the so-called outer islands where these ethnic minorities were residing. Laos, with a population of only roughly 5 million people during the period where these data come from, actually moved nearly a million people. That is really astonishing. In the Philippines, a country that I have not yet studied in depth, even more people have been moved over quite a long period. So that's one of the major threats that is faced by these ethnic minorities. Of course, they have their natural resource base. And here is a figure about forest loss with Malaysia being the highest in terms of forest loss over this 12 year period from which these data were derived. Turns out Indonesia came in third, Cambodia came in fifth. It's really quite dramatic how much of this loss of forest land has occurred within Southeast Asia. Now I wanna concentrate for a while on Borneo. Uh, the Indonesian part is Kalimantan and the Malaysian part consists of two states, Sabah and Sarawak. Now it's important to keep in mind that Malaysia is a federal system. So these two states have quite a bit of autonomy on various kinds of policies. An agreement was made after there were some secessionist noises being made on the part of these two states that resource sharing would be the following. The Malaysian government would control the oil revenues. Sabah and Sarawak would each control the forest revenues, which means that the leaders of those two states largely catering to mainstream Malays found it very convenient to cut down the forests. That's why Malaysia has had such a great loss of forests. In Indonesia, which is a unitary system, the Indonesian government controls forest revenues. And the Indonesian government has many policies that I'll get to in a little while where the question is, given the national government's control, how much of this control should be ceded 
to the indigenous people. So this is what's happened to Borneo from 1950 to 2020. And these are mappings of forested areas. Of course, many of you know that how you define a forest is a little bit tricky, but no matter how you slice it, it's quite clear that the amount of area that is reasonably considered to be forest land has diminished quite remarkably. A few reasons for this. Now, why is it that cropland in Malaysia did not seem to go up to the same degree as it did in Indonesia on that chart that I showed you previously? Well, as you could see in the bottom of this photo, this is oil palm. This has been a huge initiative on the part of the Malaysian government as well as the Indonesian government. Now, whether you consider an oil palm plantation as forests, you certainly do not consider it as national forest and you do not consider it as the kind of area where any kind of ethnic minority would be able to find some sustenance. Some of them may end up as laborers in these oil palm plantations, but that is certainly not their standard means of livelihood. Here are some figures for how much oil palm has spread from the year 2000 to 2017. And as you could see, it has really taken off, particularly in the periphery of both Indonesia's Kalimantan, that's their part of Borneo, and Sabah and Sarawak in the case of Malaysia. Now, what claim do the ethnic minorities in Borneo have that in fact, they should have the user rights to the land, particularly to the forests? Well, their belief system is called Adat. It has fairly similar characteristics to it as a lot of other minority groups around the world. It's the philosophy of group responsibility for natural resources. It's communal control over the ancestral area, which is a really important point to make that these are communities where they don't really differentiate between criminal and civil offenses because they are offenses against their society. The punishment is typically compensation rather than retribution. Imagine how this comes across among the Muslim leaders in both Malaysia and in Indonesia. If somebody kills somebody else, shouldn't they be severely punished rather than having to pay some sort of fine? So in fact, within Adat, or at least the mainstream Adat, it's very rare that people are executed or mutilated or anything of the sort. But now we have a really crucial problem. If you read this quote, by the Alliance of Indigenous People of the Archipelago. So this is an alliance that goes beyond just Borneo and even beyond Malaysia and Indonesia. Indigenous people are communities which have ancestral lands in certain geographic locations and their own value systems, ideologies, etc. While Amman's focus is on people still residing on their ancestral land, it is not clear that this definition excludes people such as the Dayak, that is these indigenous people in Borneo, who have been migrating out from the interior of Kalimantan towards the coast for the past century. In other words, the concept of ancestral land is not 
fixed. If somebody claims that their ancestral land is not where they're living now, what kind of claim do they have on it? And this is something that both the Indonesian and Malaysian governments have played on in order to reject some of the demands on the part of DIACs for their user rights. So here is a newspaper article in 2016 in which the Dayak people actually cannot apply native customary rights because in fact, this court decided by an appeal by the forest department and the state government that in fact, there is no law in Sarawak one of the two states in um, the, the state in Malaysia on Borneo that gives the force of law to customary rights claims by Dayaks over virgin forests as native customary rights. So it's no accident that the forest department appealed a previous decision because they wanted to keep the control and the state government wants to maintain the control because then they get the revenues and then they could disperse those revenues for whatever purpose they deem to be in their interest. So no wonder that large banner that I showed previously uh, is mobilizing some of the DIACs on the Malaysian part of Borneo. Now in Indonesia, ADAT also has some limitations even though in principle, as long as a community maintains a dot, then it should have the customary rights. Indonesian constitution as of 1999 said, the state recognizes and respects customary law communities and their traditional rights. Now we get to some of the catches, provided they still exist and are in accordance with community developments and the principle of the Unitary Republic of Indonesia as regulated by statute. When I came across this, I was reminded of a case in Colombia where there is a designation of certain areas where indigenous people live called resguardos, sort of a combination of reserves and guardianship in which those local people have control over the user rights if, but only if they maintain their lifestyles. So the moment somebody picks up a chainsaw, they're no longer living the way they had been living before. So you can imagine that in cases like that, whether it's in Borneo or other parts of Indonesia or in some of the forests in Latin America, that in fact, this becomes a really important issue of ambiguity. Well, now we start to get into the weeds a little bit. Uh, this 1999 forest, Indonesian forestry law said there are state forests, hutan negara. There are also forests over which rights have been granted, hutan hak. Now, the term granted here is really very important because that implies that the government has the right to assign this. In other words, it's not recognizing pre-existing customary rights enshrined in the history of the country. If, if an entity like the government grants rights, then presumably it can withdraw the rights. And the other part, state forest, as referred to in Article 5.1a, can take the form of customary forests. So, okay, state forests could be customary forests. But does that mean that the state forest designation can trump customary forest? There was an important constitutional court decision in 2013 that said the forestry law is invalid unless it is interpreted to remove the word state. 
In other words, let's say that these areas, in fact, are Hutan Hak. These are areas where the indigenous people do have the rights. But the Constitution still says the state recognizes and respects Adat, integrated Adat law communities along with their traditional customary rights, as long as these remain in existence, okay, and are in accordance with societal development and the principle of Indonesia and shall be regulated by law. Ambiguity is one of the major tools that state officials use to get what they want. And it's hard to think of a more ambiguous phrase than the principle of Indonesia. I'd like to shift now to ethnic minorities in Myanmar and Thailand. I'm sorry that these two maps don't fit together, but they're very, very different approaches of the two countries. Myanmar's strategy in dealing with ethnic minorities has been expulsion. Thailand's strategy has been much more with the carrot than the stick. It's been much more voluntary. And when it comes to property rights, in Myanmar, it's really been open resource war. In Thailand, there are areas protected through royal parks and other reserves. My wife and I spent a wonderful afternoon visiting a Karen village within one of the national parks in uh, Northern Thailand. And in fact, People were tending to their fields. Uh, they were engaged in the typical activities they would have been engaged in before, except that the government also provided employment in flower growing and other aspects of horticulture. So it looked very much like these people were getting along pretty well, or probably we would not have been brought to that area. But in Myanmar, according to the UN Special Rapporteur on Myanmar, 1988, over a million people were forcibly relocated without compensation, moved to towns, villages, or relocation camps, which were basically detention camps. So we read with disgust what's going on in Xinjiang and China, but how many people are aware of the fact that something quite comparable had been going on in Myanmar. And in fact, if you ask why that is the case, you'll see that the forests in Myanmar are largely in the more remote areas in the north. And the map on the right shows where the forest losses have occurred within Myanmar. Moreover, it turns out that the government of Myanmar, now a military government, as I'm sure you know, actually does not control the country. There are open insurrections going on all around the North and increasingly in both the East and the West, and some in the far South in Myanmar. So if you wonder why the military in Myanmar feels that it has to intervene, it's because it sees the existential threat to the whole country. And in fact, whether it should be a country is something that is very much up in, up in the air. If you look at the map on the right-hand side, you'll see there are a lot of locations on the Thai side where Karen and other minorities are living. These are areas well recognized by the government and they're well serviced by the government. And of course, there are others that are further inland and in some of the heights. And in fact, the Karen kids are going to school. They speak uh, Karen languages at home. They are learning to speak 
standard tie, but all the reports I've read indicate that things are going much more smoothly in Thailand than in the other Southeast Asian countries. And of course, there are some problems. And anthropologists love to write about these problems and they're, they're valid. It's certainly true that ethnic distinctiveness is eroding, but still Thailand does seem to be doing a better job than the other countries. Now, if we shift to Laos, as I mentioned earlier, there was a highly coercive resettlement program, moving people from the uplands, which happens to be largely in the north, shifting these 900,000 people to flatter areas. And this was essentially a campaign against shifting cultivation. Anthropologists who understand that small populations can be viable in terms of their natural resource sustainability, if they engage in shifting cultivation, they can do quite fine. Those who don't like this, of course, call it slash and burn agriculture. They write books about it and they say, this is really a horrible thing. We need to get these people not to shift around, but to engage in sedentary agriculture on the grounds that sedentary agriculture would be better for some reason. Well, it turns out that that's not actually the case. The 1989 Tropical Forest Action Plan said that by the year 2000, 60% of the population would be engaged, that was engaged in shifting cultivation, would then be resettled into other areas. Implementation of a development, rural development policy, new roads, schools, sanitation works, implementation of land tenure reform, intensification of agriculture. This sounds really great. However, Everard and Godinu point out the resettlement was really conceived as a means of speeding up the integration of these many ethnic minorities into Lao national culture. And in essence, changing their whole traditional way of life. But did this work in terms of sustainable agriculture? The US Department of Agriculture does a lot of work for developing countries and did an assessment of this plan, pointing out that the National Land Allocation Program of the 1990s distributed two or three hectares to each adult in the rural, fi rural farming communities and required that they would be in fixed location. In other words, no more shifting cultivation. And now I'll read this quote. The problem is that the land is being utilized much more intensively for annual cropping than before. And the fallow period on most fields has been reduced to three years or less. Upland rice yields and production are also reportedly declining as a result of these problems. And so the USDA concludes that this is simply not sustainable. And it's leading to food shortages in the highland communities that depend on these sloping lands. And in fact, instead of giving two to three hectares on average, they would need 40 to 60 hectares for them to operate in this land as if they're to be sedentary. So it was complete bust. Now, there's a very different kind of phenomenon, which is the displacement through development. Obviously, major hydroelectric dams are one component of this displacement. The Mekong River Commission, which is this entity that 
everybody but China is involved in who's, who has Mekong River land pointed out there were 11 proposed mainstream dams on the Mekong lower river basin. So this is past China. And it would cause huge losses in terms of the fish and displace about 100,000 people. Now, compared to some of the displacements in China, which have been in the 20 million range, this doesn't seem like a lot. But then again, this is not, these are not countries of 1.4 billion people. So a huge problem here is how to deal with developments that need to provide electricity to Southeast Asia, which is one of the fastest growing areas in terms of industrialization and the need for electricity. Well, it turns out it is possible to provide reasonably benign hydroelectric dams. Uh, my wife and I visited one a couple of years ago in Laos. This was developed by a Thai company. It's actually owned by the government of Laos. And they spent millions of dollars making sure that the fish, in fact, could get through this dam, it's right, it's, it's a run of the river dam right on the Mekong. And they actually have not just a fish ladder, but also a fish lock and a fish elevator. They spent millions doing the research on this to see in fact, whether it would be viable, whether you could create a system where the fish of different species can go through it at different speeds. They really put an enormous amount of effort into this. It's now been operating since October of 2020. And the jury is still out as to whether this in fact will maintain downstream fishing. The people who are displaced by this dam now live in villages that we saw that are better than the other dwellings around there in Laos. So there is hope in this respect. Let me draw my conclusions now, since I'm supposed to leave time for questions. First, the best way for minorities to maintain their culture and the ecosystems is for them to remain in their home territory. The idea that you would resettle 900,000 people in Laos or that in Myanmar you'd move more than a million. This, this is a recipe for undermining not just the cultures but also the ecosystems. These people for millennia have adapted to the ecosystems. Second, ethnic minorities have been trying to recapture their home areas and their user rights. Uh, they've organized. Uh, they now call themselves Dayaks in, in Borneo, both in the Indonesian and Malaysian areas. Uh, there are movements like this in the other countries, but they are against stiff opposition, which is prejudiced against them. In many instances, they are still considered to be less fully human than the mainstream people in these countries. Third point, displacement, which often really has the motivation of cultural homogenization, or if you will, cultural genocide and land grabbing. So let's kick these people out so we can use the forests for logging or for oil palm or infrastructure. These are all sources of conflict and deprivations for these minorities in terms of cultural integrities, but also their standards of living. But better policies are possible stronger legal institutions are possible. 
and more responsible infrastructure could really make a huge difference in preserving the rights and the cultures and the ecosystems where these minorities live. So I'm open to questions, comments, diatribes, whatever you want to discuss. Well, either everything was perfectly clear or you dismissed everything I said from the very outset. Rebecca, is there a Q&A box that I need to get access to? Yes, there is, Professor Asher. Can you see it? No, I cannot see it. OK, let me go ahead and read the questions to you. So we have a question. I'm from sorry. I just found see it. it. OK, I you just... found it, right? So So I think Stephen and Mark, and then Stephen again. Okay, so Stephen says sulfuric acid from re degeneration of vegetation underwater. Yes, that can be a problem with hydroelectric dams. And Stephen also says dams in Borneo, we learn, can create toxicities. How about along the Mekong? Yes, some dams do create toxicities if they're holding back the waters. So these are these are cases of reservoir dams. If we distinguish among the run of the river dams that are really not holding back much water at all, dams with huge um, walls that hold it back, there are really important differences. And we've known for a long time with the Aswan High Dam that those sorts of dams can uh, lead to quite a bit of dying vegetation and toxicities and the like. Uh, let me try now to address Mark's points. Um, what issues will run of the river dams that you cite? It, one issue is the uncertainty and the investments. Should we wait before building? I just published an article in the journal Energy Policy that pointed out that unless we build a lot more hydroelectric dams and unless they are responsible hydroelectric dams, we're gonna have even more coal burning even unto the year 2050. This is the US Department of Energy's reference case. So the question then is, how do you get the funding for them? And the answer is climate funds, clean development mechanism as that gets revamped under the Paris Agreement and other mechanisms like that where people from the first world really need to put much, much more money into the development of reasonable dam designs and the funding 
for those designs. And there, there are mechanisms that are being developed in order to try to accomplish that. Now, you want more time? Uh, Mark also writes, and in that time, we will have more data to, to suggest to give us a better idea of their success. Well, I think time is of the essence. I'm now going to try to address Isabel's. Isabel says, I don't know if you could all see this, but Isabel says, your presentation wasn't really too bad. Uh, I was wondering about your example of more responsible hydro dams. Do you have more case studies of these? What do you think of micro hydro? Okay, those are excellent questions. Um, there are not that many examples of responsible large scale hydroelectric dams. Uh, there's marvelous operation in San Francisco called the uh, Natural Heritage Institute that has done a lot of work with the Cambodian government on how to design a dam that would do minimal damage, but still be profitable enough for investors to be interested in it if there were subsidies from first world sources. And there is a plan to accomplish that. However, the Cambodian government for reasons beyond my ken has decided now to have a moratorium on hydroelectric dams for 10 years. Therefore, the uh, Natural Heritage Institute proposed a floating solar array on the Mekong which would not be economically viable, would not produce as much electricity unless there were subsidies. So the whole point here is that you need to subsidize the development of hydropower. Now it turns out that you could put a floating solar array in the reservoir of a hydroelectric dam. And that solar array can then be hooked up to the same transmission lines as those that are being used to convey the electricity generated from the dam. Uh, Phoebe asks, do you have any recommendations for concrete economic policies that either local governments or international organizations could take to help minority groups? Yes, definitely. Put more pressure on governments like the Indonesian government that makes very positive noises when it comes to rights of minorities, but then the government has to put its policies where its mouth is. If it's serious about respecting Adat, if it could reduce the ambiguity of what it means to claim user rights, uh, then that can make a big difference. And governments like the government of Indonesia and Malaysia and the other countries, in fact, have a strong incentive to look better in the eyes of the developed countries, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and so on. So, Isabel Rogers asks if I could suggest good papers or sources on the legal concepts. Uh, if you look at some of the references in my PowerPoint, you could find some of those. Um, this, this has been recorded. So if you go through that, you may be able to freeze it at that point. Or you could send me uh, an email uh, William.Asher, A-S-C-H-E-R, at cmc.edu, and I would be happy to send you more references. Uh, Stephen says, Malaysia and Myanmar, both formerly British colonies, 
but yet the former seems somewhat well-governed while Myanmar seems to be a mess politically and economically. Any thoughts, 25 words or less, why Myanmar has been so fraught? Well, for one thing, if you forcibly move over a million people, uh, this is gonna be fraught. Uh, also, Malaysia had much more of a melee dominance, despite the presence of Chinese and, and Indians, but fewer of the minority ethnic groups on peninsular Malaysia. And also the Malaysian government has not had the kind of resettlement programs that Indonesia has had to the Malaysian part of, of Borneo. Um, I don't know enough about the history of Burma to understand why the minorities have been so poorly treated. But my impression is that that's gone way back and it has really never ceased. So the same border groups say straddling the Myanmar and Thai border um, have never accepted governance by the Burma. Um, and they, had no, they have no incentive to accept that. In Thailand, as long as they can keep some of their cultural distinctiveness and not be subject to some of the more obnoxious aspects of so-called nation building, um, things could have gone a lot better. So Rebecca, it looks like we're done. Is that correct? I guess that's it. If nobody <laughs> has any questions, maybe we just wait a few seconds. Yeah, I guess that will be it. Thank you, Professor Asher. This is a really interesting presentation. I'm going to email you my own questions right now, actually. Okay. And thanks very much that Econolab Asia has this sort of opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining.